the White House spends three weeks uh, trying to develop a proposal, and they send one up here uh, that calls for $1.6 trillion in new taxes, uh, calls for a little, not even $400 billion in cuts, and they want to they wanna have this uh, extra spending that's actually greater than the amount they're willing to cut. I mean, it's, it's, it was not a serious proposal. And, uh, and so right now we're almost nowhere. Where the clock is really ticking right now is on middle class taxes. The sooner Congress gets this done, the sooner our economy will get a boost. And it would then give us in Washington more time to work together on that long range plan to bring down deficits in a balance. If there's no announcement of scheduling of the middle income tax cut, which by the way has tremendous support in the Republican caucus, I think we would get a 100% vote on it if it came to the floor. Uh, if, if, the, if it is not scheduled, that then on Tuesday we will be introducing a discharge petition, which you know, with, if we could get to 118 signatures, uh, would bring the bill automatically to the floor. Have any of those um, Republicans who you are sure want to decouple high income rates and middle income rates um, said to you or any member of your team that they would sign a discharge petition? No. She won't get it. Look, in the context of what the administration offered the Republicans yesterday, she'll get nothing because this is just a pure giveaway and the idea that they're going to cut in the future is ridiculous. What the president proposed yesterday is an increase in spending. This is the old, this is the Democrats of the McGovern age, tax plus extra spending. The, the president ran on a balanced approach, which meant, and Jay Carney has repeated the phrase a hundred times. That means we raise taxes, which the Republicans have already conceded, and we cut spending. They've done nothing on spending except to propose an increase in spending. So it's preposterous. In the context of that offer of nothing, a ludicrous offer, which is essentially humiliating, there's, they're, they're, they are not going to get uh, any Republicans signing on. If Obama continues with this position, he won't get anywhere. If he concedes, begins to talk about spending cuts, he might come up with an agreement. But he seems to think that he needs to offer nothing because he's in such strong a position. And I think he's truly overestimating his hands. And that's the great irony that if you go over the cliff, what we're going to get is a restoration of the Clinton rates on everybody, which if you watch the campaign, uh, the Democrats argued that the Clinton era was economic paradise. So if, you know, they, they balanced the budget, they created 20 million new jobs, so why not return to, to the Clinton tax rates across the board? But I, I just want to make one point about uh, what the leverage is here. I think if the, the Democrats imagine that Republicans are going to cave without anything on spending, they are overreading the, the, their wow. head. And the president understands that if he goes over the cliff, he poisoned the second term. And that is really, I think, a threat to everything he wants to do. And one more thing. Are the middle class tax cuts permanent then? Or do they get sunsetted? I think they're pretty, they're more permanent than they ever were in the Bush years. I mean, I think this is a huge victory for Republicans. They get 98% of the Bush cuts signed by a Democratic president, which were, these cuts were not made permanent when George Bush was reelected and the Republicans controlled Congress. This is better tax policy from a Democratic president and a half Democrat controlled Congress than, than Republicans were able to get put into law in 2005. Do they give away something? Yes. Do you have to give well, away the upper income tax rates? As a matter of policy, it does absolutely nothing about our catastrophic deficits. It's eight cents on the dollar. It's all a political attempt by Obama. He created uh, this issue as a way to have a class war issue in the campaign. It will have no effect on deficits. It will have no effect on rescuing us. And I think Republicans ought not to play that game. It well, doesn't think, help the economy. Well, to answer your question, the middle ta class tax cuts are permanent. And the response to Charles would be that the, the Obama White House believes this will help to grow the economy. They're completely wrong. That's the problem. Every week, viewers vote for your choice online in this, our Friday Lightning Round poll. And this week, Cabinet Reach Shuffle won with 36% with the vote of the vote. When Susan Rice lost Susan Collins, perhaps the most mild-mannered senator uh, in the Congress, and the senator who introduced Rice, 
when she was nominated to be the UN ambassador. When you lose Collins, you've lost the world. And that, I think, I don't quite understand how she went around with this, uh, these meetings where she was going to present her best side to McCain, to Graham, uh, to Collins, to Ayotte, and she came out on the, I'm talking about um, Susan Rice, she came out on the wrong end of this. Uh, for some reason, I think her nomination is in deep trouble. The president, if he's smart, is not going to nominate her because if he does, the Benghazi issue is going to rise again. U.N. Palestinian vote significance, big picture. There's a great irony. The vote happened on precisely and deliberately on the day on which, in 1947, the General Assembly voted to divide British Palestine into two states, a Jewish state and an Arab state. The Jews accepted it. The Arabs rejected it because they couldn't countenance the existence of a Jewish state, and they made war, and they made war five times. Had the Arabs accepted that resolution 65 years ago, we would now have a Palestinian state that would be 65 years old. It doesn't exist, but was created at the UN this week, was a fictional state in a useless body, the UN General Assembly. Uh, I don't think it's going to help the Palestinians at all. Winner and loser, Bill. I'll continue with my class warfare theme here, which I'd like to come back to every year, once a year or two. Um, the, winner of the winner of the week, I think, is the 19 top executives of Hostess Brands, who may get up bonuses up to, worth up to almost $2 million as the company goes out of business for managing the going out of business while the workers, of course, pension funds haven't been filled up for a year. And, and the loser. losers? Uh, the workers of America, because, you know, in this, <laughs> no, because in this budget deal that everyone's talking about, the one tax that everyone agrees should go up, apparently on the Democratic and Republican sides, with a couple of outliers, is the payroll tax, the Social Security payroll tax. So it is going to be a 2 percent. There is going to be a tax increase, in fact, in January, unless someone steps up and says, wait a second, we're giving everyone else a tax break and we're letting everyone's Social Security tax go up 2 percent? Winners and losers. Crystal's turning into a socialist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a family Amazing. tradition way back. You know? <laughs> new secretary of the Treasury sitting right over there. Uh, workers' champion. The winner, Mahmoud Abbas, locally, because he outshone Hamas on this, even though the victory he won in the UN was a Pyrrhic one. The loser, Speaker of the House, John Boehner, he offered the president a peace pipe and he got in return a, a, a demand that he turn over his sword, his shirt, and at the end, his trousers. That's a rather embarrassing position for the speaker. This has been a Sunfish production.